The biggest lesson that I want you to learn today is that diving headfirst is one of the leading causes of spinal cord injury. And all of these injuries are completely preventable. Five to 10% of all spinal cord injuries are related to diving accidents. And over 60% of these injuries are what we identify as Asia A spinal cord injuries, meaning that they cause complete paralysis, no motion or no movement in the arms or legs. 80% of these happen in men ages 15 to 30. The most common level of injury is C5 due to where the cervical spine flexes upon impact. In a headfirst dive, your skull hits the bottom. That force is transmitted through your cervical spine through a mechanism called axial loading. This can cause the bones or the ligaments in your cervical spine to shatter or tear. And when your spine dislocates, the spinal cord within the cervical spine can become compressed or transected. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 22-year-old male who dove headfirst into shallow water, striking his head on the bottom of the pool and instantly suffered a spinal cord injury, becoming paralyzed in his arms and legs. As soon as his head hit the bottom, he instantly was paralyzed and floated to the surface of the water where his friends rescued him. At first, they thought he was horsing around, but then they realized something was bad wrong. After they turned him over in the water, they realized that he could talk, but he could not move his arms and legs. So the ambulance was called and he was brought to the hospital. The CAT scan of his cervical spine was performed upon arrival to the hospital. And here you can see the most common level of injury, a C5 burst fracture. This bone basically exploded upon impact, causing these fragments to compress the spinal cord. Here you can see the MRI of the cervical spine and this gray thing right through here is a spinal cord and you can see that it's severely compressed at the level of the fracture of C5. This is the dermatomal distribution of where the nerves in our spinal cord go. C5 spinal cord injury, a patient will have maintained sensation from about here up and a small portion of the lateral aspect of the arms but everything below C5 would be completely absent, meaning loss of sensation from everything from the chest down. And that also includes any movement of any muscle group from C5 and below. The ASIA exam stands for American Spinal Injury Association, and it's a standard physical examination that we perform in individuals that have suffered a spinal cord injury. It consists of mainly three things, sensation, movement, and an anorectal examination. It gives us a standardized documentation of the level of spinal cord injury, guidance for radiographic assessment and treatment, and helps us determine if the injury is complete or incomplete. A complete spinal cord injury is classified as an Asia A, and an Asia B through E are incomplete injuries. So what's the difference? Anything that's preserved below the level of injury, even the slightest amount of sensation, can mean a significant chance for improvement in recovery long term. So the recovery for someone with an Asia A versus an Asia B can be completely different. Less than 5% of people with an Asia A spinal cord injury will regain motor function. And in Asia B or C, 40 to 70% of people could potentially regain function and perhaps some ability to walk depending on their age, level of injury, and how quickly we intervene. Our patient has a C5 Asia A spinal cord injury, meaning he can only shrug his shoulders and there are no movement in any of his arms, hands, or legs. One of the most telling signs in a man with a complete spinal cord injury is something called priapism. Have I heard of that before? It's an unwanted prolonged erection. It happens because of a loss of sympathetic tone from the spinal cord, leaving unopposed parasympathetic tone. Remember point and shoot from anatomy. P is for pointing or erection, and that's from parasympathetic tone, or S is from shooting or ejaculation from sympathetic tone. So arterial blood flow goes into the penis and without any sympathetic tone, there is lack of control of the venous outflow. So the erection is not sexual, it's completely neurologic. This is something called spinal shock. In most cases, it resolves within just a few hours. Now back to our patient, what do we do? 
In the field, the first thing we do is something called the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, and spinal immobilization is non-negotiable. Mobilizing the cervical spine in a hard collar and on a spinal board. We use CAT scan to help identify the bony injury and MRI will help us look at the spinal cord and any soft tissue injury. So when we take this patient to surgery, always remember that time is spine. Timing of surgical intervention and spinal cord injury is crucial to their recovery. Emerging data suggest even earlier intervention than we once thought, especially if the injury is incomplete because that means there are still signals that are going up and down the spinal cord. So the quicker that we decompress the spinal cord, the higher chance of improvement of their long-term function. The gold standard is getting the patient to surgery less than 24 hours after their injury. But there is continuing emerging data that suggests even as early as 8 to 12 hours is associated with better long-term outcomes. Outcomes. Delays beyond 24 hours can significantly reduce the chances of neurological recovery. One of the things that we do in a patient with a high cervical spinal cord injury is protect the airway pretty early on. Remember, C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. And most patients with any kind of cervical spinal cord injury will need prolonged respiratory support. So it's important to control the airway early on. So how do we fix this patient? In a case like this, what we would typically do is something called an anterior cervical corpectomy, where we come through an incision on the front of the neck, resect the completely damaged vertebrae, and in its place, we put a cage followed by a plate and screws, like in this animation right here. And on three column injuries, meaning that there's fractures in the front and back part of the spine, most spine surgeons will do a 360 stabilization, meaning supporting the spine with instrumentations from the front and then through a second surgery through the back part of the neck to place rods and screws. The goal of surgery is of course to stabilize the spine structurally, but also to take the pressure off of the spinal cord that's causing the ongoing damage to the cord itself. The primary goal of a compressive spinal cord lesion is to decompress the spine, but there are also medical management in which we focus on preventing secondary damage to the spinal cord. Blood pressure management to artificially elevate the mean arterial pressure to 85 for the first seven days after injury will help optimize my spinal cord perfusion. Other parts of medical management include DVT prophylaxis to help prevent blood clots in this high-risk population, using medications to help alleviate pain and spasticity, managing neurogenic shock, Neurogenic shock is a little different than spinal shock. It is caused from the disruption of sympathetic fibers, leading to a loss of vascular tone and autonomic control. This can cause vasodilation, meaning low blood pressure, and also can cause bradycardia due to the lack of autonomic response. Hypotension and bradycardia are classic signs. Other important things that we do during the acute setting is maintaining bladder and bowel management. What I mean by that is by fully catheterization, as well as digital bowel movements because remember that these patients cannot go to the bathroom on their own. Pressure ulcer prevention, nutrition, and thermoregulation are also really, really important. And lastly is rehabilitation. That is absolute key in these patients' recovery. A multidisciplinary team consisting of physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, rehab physicians, amongst many other healthcare professionals that help these patients recover. And there are many emerging therapies that are really exciting. Stem cell therapy, neuroprotective agents, exoskeleton assisted walking, electrical stimulation, and even brain machine interfacing like the Neuralink. Our patient had an Asia A spinal cord injury and has not regained any neurological function since his accident. I personally know what this means to this patient and their family as my mom suffered an Asia A C4 spinal cord injury in 1994. Many of you guys know my story. My mom was injured in the line of duty as a police officer in a catastrophic car accident. My mom never regained any functional recovery since her accident over 30 years ago. Her injury led me to want to become a doctor to help people with spinal cord injuries just like her. And I'm hopeful that over time, we will continue to improve our treatment options for patients just like her so they can continue to recover from these types of devastating accidents. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case. And if you take one thing from this case study, please 
Never ever dive into shallow water. And a matter of fact, just don't dive because the safest dive is the dive that you never take. Your life could be changed forever. If this video helps prevent even one spinal cord injury, my job here is done. Make sure you follow me for more neurotrauma education and leave a comment if you've learned something today.